Suppose your program wants to read some data that's stored on disk. This could take a while. The most common kind of disk drive has moving parts. If you were to look inside a typical hard drive, well, you'd, you'd break it. These things are airtight because even a single speck of dust would be enough to stop them working. But you do occasionally see hard drives with transparent cases, and inside you'll see two main moving parts. There's the disk itself. This is usually made of metal or glass, and it's coated in a thin layer of magnetic material. In fact, most drives contain multiple disks stacked on top of each other, all rotating about the same axis. And then there's the read-write head, which is at the end of an arm that moves back and forth across the disk, reading or writing data. The entire surface of the disk is covered in data. When your program asks to read some data, the operating system and the disk controller will work out where exactly that data resides. For example, Perhaps the data we want happens to be where this little blue stripe is. To read that data, a couple of things need to happen. First, the arm needs to be moved so that the bit of the disk containing our data will pass directly beneath the read-write head. And then, once the head is in position, we have to wait until the rotation of the disk brings that data under the head. And once that happens, the head can read the data and the disk controller will then transfer that data into the computer's memory. Now, in human terms, this all happens pretty quickly. It's faster than the blink of an eye, and I've obviously slowed things right down in this illustration. But actually, compared to the rate at which modern CPUs work, the disk moves painfully slowly. It can take several milliseconds, which is time enough for the processor to execute many millions of instructions. Recently, solid-state disks have started to replace the mechanical ones that we had used for decades, but even those don't work instantaneously. It takes a significant amount of time to send the message that asks the drive for data, and for the drive to send the data back to the computer. Solid-state drives are orders of magnitude faster than their predecessors, but they still look desperately slow compared to the speed at which the CPU can process data once it's been loaded. So for an operation this slow, does it make sense for the CPU to just sit and wait until the data arrives? Wouldn't it be better if the computer could get on with other work in the meantime? Well, to some extent it can. The operating system knows when a program is using the CPU to execute code, and it knows when it's waiting for data from disk. So it can let other programs use the CPU in the interim. But what about the program that asked for the data? For example, what if you're using a word processor and it was looking up a word in its spell-checking dictionary to work out whether it should add a red squiggly underline to what you just wrote? It's great to have your spelling checked, but you don't want the program to freeze while you're typing. If you're a good speller, it'd be particularly frustrating to have the computer keep interrupting you simply for it to confirm that everything's fine. So it's sometimes not enough that some other program can use the CPU while we wait for the disk, or the network, or whatever. We want the program we're using to be able to continue too. We want concurrency within the program, rather than merely across the whole computer. Now one way to achieve this is multi-threading. If our word processor were to ensure that any dictionary lookups were always performed on a different thread than the one that handled our keystrokes, we'd be okay. However, this is not the only option. An alternative is for the operating system to let us use the disk asynchronously. And all that means is that we'd make an API call asking for some data from disk, and this API call would not wait for that data. It would return straight away, enabling the thread to continue to respond to keyboard input even while it waits for a response from the disk. It's important to understand that this does not have to involve multiple threads. A lot of people mistakenly assume that asynchronous APIs are just wrappers around a multi-threaded implementation. Some are, but most are not. Once the computer has sent a message to the disk controller asking for the data, there's nothing more the CPU can do regarding that operation until that data comes back. Computers contain specialized hardware dedicated to reading from disk. The information can be fetched from the disk and transferred into the computer's memory without any direct intervention from the CPU. So this is effectively a sort of parallelism, albeit a very limited one. 
Even on a single core computer, it's quite possible for the CPU to execute code in parallel with the disk controller fetching data from the disk. Only when the work completes does the CPU need to get involved again. The disk controller will send some sort of signal to the CPU to let it know that the work is complete. The operating system handles that signal and uses this to let the program know that the data is now available. I'm being rather vague, of course. It turns out that this last part, discovering when an asynchronous operation completes, can introduce a lot of complexity for developers. It can make it difficult to coordinate complex operations that involve a lot of individual steps. It can make it hard to manage error conditions without going insane. This is where the TPL comes in. It offers a model for asynchronous operation in the form of the task class.